It started in 1952. Uh, the radio club, the Dayton Amateur Radio Association, contributed a hundred dollars to, to fund this, this their first ham fest. It took place at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Dayton. They expected 300 people to come, 600 came. But they wanted to do something that was different than all the other ham fests. They wanted to have forums. They wanted to, to, to have people come and make presentations about things. So the first year they had six forums. Uh, now there are five forum rooms that are busy all two and a half days from about nine o'clock in the morning until five o'clock. And, and oh, by the way, the Hamvention is not just what happens at the Green County Expo. Center, but we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. So they had 600 people show up. The FCC agreed to come and give exams at that at that ham fest of, back in 1952. Um, and that was important because that was back in the day if you wanted to get a license, you had to go to an FCC office. So if you live in Dayton, you had to go to Cincinnati. Or if you lived in Columbus, you had to go to Cincinnati. And once a year, they would show up in some of these outlying cities to give examinations. Uh, so the FCC came and, and, and gave ham radio examinations. They took the $100 and bought a 12-inch TV to be a door prize. And I've been thinking the past couple of days, I wonder what happened to that 12-inch TV. Um, <laughs> did somebody take that home, plug it in, and watch TV? Or did somebody take it home and take it apart <laughs> and build something with it? I'd really like to know what, what the official answer is, if, it, if it's no. Uh, in 1964, they moved to the Hera Arena, which was a, a big convention center kind of thing out in the northwestern suburb of Dayton, um, which is an action area called Trotman. And they were there until 2000, well, I, I was going to say 17, but there were some years there before 17, 18, and, um, 19, when Hera was closed because they had, um, and they were run down, they had tax problems, they had maintenance problems. And, so Dayton moved the Hamvention, the Dara moved the Hamvention to Green County Zenith. Bob, well, yeah. I remember why the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? Well, the, the, the tornado. Well, the, the tornado in Zenith was much earlier, though. But the, the, there was a tornado that came and finally hit knocked Hera. down. It actually hit Hera, but that was, that was while it was abandoned. And oh, two years ago, we went by there, and it's, it's all been leveled. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's not so still left. Well, I didn't go this year. Oh. But two years ago we went up there and, and the, the, the building had been leveled. And, uh, so we'll see what happens with that. How many people in the room have actually been to the Hamden? That's good. That's good. Uh, as my friend Harry Daniels used to say, you owe it to yourself once in a lifetime to go to the hand pension. There are at least 600 exhibitors inside in these buildings, forums that are going on all the time, and 2,000 flea market spaces. Um, and I guess what I would tell you is that I learned long ago you can't do it all in one trip. So you have to sort of plan your business. So, Anything you want to add to what I just said? Oh, no. It's, um, it's just a, something that everybody that's a ham needs to go to at least once in their life. So, and how many times have you gone? Probably this is my sixth or seventh time. But I I was going, um, was it, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. 40 
years I did that. And how and how many times have you been? This is my second. Second. Yeah. I got you both feet. I've been here at least 24 times. Oh my goodness. But I lived in Columbus, Ohio, which is like an hour away. And while I was living in Columbus, I made it twice. And then I moved here. So, so tell us about four days in May. All right. So. Uh, in case anybody missed it, I am a ardent QRP person, and I do Morse code because QRP uh, works best with Morse code, five watts or less. And um, years ago, probably 30, 40 years ago, our QRP association, the, uh, uh, the club I belong to, it's called Amateur Radio Club International. And my number is 4281. So when we have QRP contest, we exchange this, this number. Of course, the lower the number, the more prestige you are in, in this organization. And they've been around probably 40 to 50 years now. I have, I have the publications from them that are, it looks like they were mimeographed on somebody's old mimeograph machine. Uh, but about 25 years ago, they, they thought, let's, let's do this conference before Dayton. So they titled this Four Days in May. So it starts on Thursday, and it's conferences all day on Thursday. Then on Friday and Saturday, they're free to go to the ham convention in Xenia. And at night on Friday, they have a uh, what they call Vendors Night, and all these QRP vendors are there, Elecraft, folks like that, showing off their wares. And then on Saturday, they have a contest of building kits and things like this, and they judge, you know, like how, how low can you go and still, you know, I mean, we're talking microwatts kind of stuff like this. Sort of like uh, uh, Jim and uh, Tim, Tim. Tim, sorry, uh, is doing with his his radio there. So it's it's a fun thing, and then and then they have a banquet the last night to um, to commence everything, and then they give away a lot of door prizes. So first day, like I said, four days in May. This is the conference banquet, and it is technically most of it's over my head. Okay, so I got this. Anybody familiar with our, our Arduino and things like this? So this talk uh, that this fellow gave, of, he's a, it's India, VR, in, VU. A VU came from India, is that right? Yeah, VU, VU2. VU. And he's, he's a uh, great uh, builder and kit builder, and he gave these out to us, complimentary. And it's actually an SDR start starter. Thing. So all you need to do is put some parts on here, and I have the information. And since I am all uh, over my head, anybody who is interested in this uh, is welcome to do it. And I don't know if anybody's on the air here. I think uh, there's a couple of folks that are into this kind of stuff. All right, so the first first talk was um, the construction and use of a who's who's that okay so this fella built a, uh, a little device so when you go on out to let's say POTA or activate on the air and you have uh, people that want to know well, where is this station you plug in the call sign and it'll show you the the rate the uh, coordinates of the station and where where it's going. And the reason for this is uh, a lot of times that you don't have internet contact, okay? And you know, rather than bring your computer out and do all this stuff, this, this device was probably a little bit bigger than this. So he talked about building this, this device, which again was over my head. The second, the second one was... So you're saying you spent two days not understanding a single thing. I tried to stay away. I had a lot of coffee. The second talk was called cool. top, <laughs> top Junk Box Projects. Okay? So, for hams that have been around for a long time, and you 
probably have a box full of stuff that you say, I'm going to need this one day. So he took this concept and he, he demonstrated how he made 10 things out of a junk box. Okay, So that was the second presentation. Uh, and then this one, this is the one Asha Fairham, the VU, the VU2 from India, came and did this presentation, talked about it. And again, there's the schematic over my head. Okay. <laughs> In fact, I forgot how to do a culpit circuit, which was on the exam when I, years ago. So that was that was this yep. this project. Uh, and that was called Evolving CW to SDRs and using SBITX to bring CW to 21st century. All about this little guy. Uh, next talk was Adventures of QRP Evangelist. So this fellow just talked about how enthusiastic the folks are in our organization. By the way, they were over 200 and I think 235 attended this QRP conference. And uh, oh, then we broke for lunch. So I, that was that was the best one. <laughs> then Tom Witherspoon. He understood that. Tom Witherspoon has got a very active uh, YouTube on activating POTA sites. And he goes out there with these QRP radios, throws up an antenna on the tree, and he he shows you how he's operating. So that was that was pretty cool. That I got to be I, I've seen a lot of his POTA activations on YouTube. Then then this one, Wayne Burdick, is anybody familiar with Ellicraft? Okay. So Wayne gave a uh, talk about developing this new QRP radio, the Kilo Hotel One, KH1. It's a handheld radio, sideband, CW, built-in antenna, and it does all, all the handbands. So after that presentation, that cost me over $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> that was, there's a picture of him holding on. That, yeah, there's a picture of me up here holding hold that radio. My wife does not know it, <laughs> but I've, she will now. I've been I've been frantically scrambling in my in my shack to sell stuff yeah. to make it a watch. Okay, so it actually won't cost me anything, and it's not going to be available until November or December. That's that's how much. So you bought a vaporware radio for a thousand bucks. It, it, this thing is, when you hold it in your hand, it's like, oh my, I have to have one, right? So that's, I got, I got bitten by that. The, um, oh, this talk was called The Amazing Ther Thermomatic Valve. This guy was a, a college professor at Frostburg University. He's retired. He talked about tubes, okay? Tubes. Uh, I mean, everything you want to know and don't want to know about tubes. This guy was just over the top. Almost fell asleep on this one. All right? And then the last talk was called, now this was, this was pretty cool, Stealth Operations from Hotel Rooms and Other Unlikely QTHs. All right? So when, uh, when I go traveling, and we've been, now that I retire, we've been doing cruises and everything. I take my QRP radio. You know, you don't have to have an AC thing to plug in. All you need is a couple of AA batteries. So I've operated from cruise ships, standing on the bow of the, of the ship as it's plowing through early morning, so hopefully not many people would notice, tapping out Morse code <laughs> to see if I can make some contacts. And I have made contacts. So this last cruise, I was sitting there with a beer and my QRP radio and the antenna. It was a, it was a uh, vertical antenna hanging over the side of the ship. And this guy walks up and he said, have you caught anything? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, but that was, I did stay awake for this one. So this is pretty cool. So if you, if you travel and go to hotels, go on cruises, whatever, <clears throat> It's pretty cool to take a little radio and be able to operate and, and talk to the world. So, for anybody who'd like to look at this, um, and I, geez, I took notes on this thing. Uh, 
but here's here's all the stuff that's in it, and uh, it it's just it's an amazing conference. Even if you're not interested in QRP uh, radios, these these guys are just amazing folks, and uh, it was one of the highlights of, of the trip. So I did that Thursday, Friday I headed to the Hamfest, and I went, went to a couple of forums, like I mentioned, the one about bringing in uh, schools students. And then I went to one with the FCC. For any old timers that have been on the radio and they get interference from, from people that shouldn't even be on the radio, the FCC talked about what they're doing to overcome this, okay? So uh, it, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, frustrating when this happens. So they have nets, you know, that, like the maritime net things, and people, they get frustrated and they say, well, you know, why is somebody authorized to operate on that net? Well, they've been there for 50 years, and then people try to interfere with the thing. So the FCC talked about what they're doing, and then also they wanted to let people know that they have so much to deal with, like cell phone towers, cell phone frequencies, uh, all the commercial frequencies, aircraft, all this stuff. So one cool thing I found out, anybody familiar with Tentech? So they had a Tentec booth there, and Tentec's been out of business. They're coming back. What I didn't realize was that all the towers, the, the uh, airplane, uh, air, air, what air traffic uh, control, air traffic control towers, use a Tentec commercial radio for receiving, and all the planes that fly have a HF transmitter in them. I thought that was long gone. I thought they were all using satellites. They all are required to keep HF. On. Did you know this? I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, Jim is the ten tower. Of Wally, they flew for uh, American band. Yeah. And so he used to give me a call when he'd come over on on twenty on forty on seventy five meter upper side band. Yeah. They, there's a couple of frequencies. They upper side band. Yeah. There's a couple of frequencies that the aircraft still will transmit on HF. But I said, the old days, there used to be an antenna <laughs> wire from the tail of the plane to the front. I said, well, where's, I don't see these antennas anymore. They said it's built into the tail that you don't see it. It's, it's kind of a unique kind of shape. So that was pretty cool. And Tentac makes those commercial radios for the towers. And they are also coming back, and they're going to come out with a Tentac amateur radio, they said, possibly next year. So they're still alive. Uh, I've been saying that for five years. I know. <laughs> but it was interesting to talk to these guys about about how the aircraft still have to have HF in the planes as a backup. So that's that's about all I have. Did, when you went to the, uh, the, did they have a banquet? You talked about the oh, banquet. Oh, yes. Well, last the last prizes? night there's a banquet. Their door prizes. And there were there were door prizes. I won. What did I win? I won one of these. Um, what do you call those boxes that are waterproof? The uh, Pelican case. Oh, yeah. I won a small Pelican case with one of my QRP radios. Put it in it. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, there are other banquets that take place. Flex Radio has actually have two banquets that they're doing. Uh, and uh, Southwestern DX Association has a banquet. Had a banquet for years. And. Um, John Green was going to that southwestern Ohio, and um, and he won a big transceiver mm -hmm. as a grand prize at, at that. Okay, Ellencraft uh, gave away one of the KH ones, yeah. so I held on to my ticket. When I didn't win it, I pulled out the Visa card. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled out the other ticket. I pulled out the right. other. <laughs> any any questions on this? Four days of May. A couple of things. One of them is I won a Yezu 710. Wow, uh, RV uh, hey, rally. Huh? Did you want a seven? Brand new, but I don't need it. So if somebody wants to buy it, I give you the heck of a deal on it. So well, you know they had a four hundred dollar off during date. Did they? Yay yeah, yeah, suit during during the. Well, I have no idea what it's worth because I got it. For the I I pay exactly what I during date. I, I, I am married to a seven ten. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's two. Don't tell my wife in the same meeting. <laughs> but um. Uh, I love my 710. We have a relationship. But during Dayton, and it was only during Dayton, they had the Yesu rebate was going on for 200 and Ham Radio Outlet 
at a $200 off sale. So you can get a, a, a really, really nice rake for $7.99. They were selling a brand new three-year warranty SDR FT710 field. That's the one without the external speaker. That's what I mean. For $7.99. And you know what that would cost you in 1966? $79. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you could get in 1966 for $79? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> But, but, but seriously, that was a screaming deal. Oh, yeah. Uh, so while the four days of May was taking place, there was also Contest University, which is started by Tim Duffy, K3LR, the founder of uh, DX Engineering. And it's a, it's a, a, a day-long um, seminar on contesting, how to, how to develop and improve your contesting skills. And um, so that's, that's, that's one that you could go to. And, I've been thinking about I've been thinking about both of these, but I think I'll probably go to the contesting one before I go to four days of May. So, Dave, uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, First, I, I got to correct. I don't think I'm an expert, but I'm glad I'm here. My dad always said that X is a has been and spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, th this is my uh, second experience at Hambeshi. Three years ago. Um, I am, many of you know, WD3O, David out of Richmond, uh, called me and told me his wife would not let him go to Hamvention unless he had a chaperone. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. Well, David had just had heart surgery, oh, okay. and uh, his wife was concerned, you know, that he'd, you know, get in trouble and, and somebody need to be with him. So, yeah, I'd never been to Hamvention. I've, I'm still a new ham, and I was even a newer ham three years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, he kind of told me what it was, uh, you know, go there and work the special event station. So it was a good experience. It was, it was quite overwhelming um, when I was, was there the first time and, and almost as overwhelming um, the second time. But we have a, a – what I did was uh, worked at the special event station, and it's – not a typical special event station that a lot of us work on the air, you know, where there's somebody logging and you have to fight pile-ups uh, to get in there. In fact, if you look at, at some of the, there's a puppet in our station right there. It's not a very serious special event station. So they let puppets in and anyone else who wanted to come in off the street. And our, our job as moderators uh, were to, you know, make sure they follow FCC rules and of course the it's radio. Is, <laughs> that's your radio. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, we, we were required to work eight hours over the course of Hamvention. In exchange for that, we got free admission. Uh, we didn't have to stand in lines and we got close in parking. Wow. Uh, volunteer parking, we got a special color badge. so. We picked up our credentials the day before and just walked in uh, without standing in line. And How did the sign up work for that? Did you, just, you sign up? The they called me back for some reason after the second year, so it's. it's uh, well, but I mean, initially, like if you wanted to work the special event station. David's been doing this for years and years, so it's. You know, if there's interest, I can. If you show up and he sees you there, you'll get invited. I've been invited. I haven't done it yet. But I've worked them on the other side. Yeah, they, they, they recruit, uh, I think in January. We've already got our place for next year. Um, but um, they do CW, too. Yeah. So the radios we had uh, were all ICOM. Uh, we had a 7300, a 9700, a 7610, and their small QRP radios, a 905 and a 705. So we have. Had them all set up there. They had nice keys from. Uh, it's ben in Galley. Uh, what was it? Ben Galley. Ben Galley keys, uh, Radio Sport headsets uh, for us to use, and uh, nice desk mics. From Icon. Uh, they had a unique antenna that is called a tuna antenna, like not tuna fish, but tune antenna, and. Uh, what that was, uh, I don't have any pictures of it, but it was a mechanical, they had a, a servo motor or something in, in the top, and you you would uh, adjust the length of your legs on your inverted V. So you had a 
a perfect resonant. You didn't have to mess around with tuners. You, you switch to low power and put it on ready and just watch your SWR uh, tune. So um, that was a unique antenna. I, I think they're around twelve hundred dollars, but we got to play with it and uh, got pretty good results, I, I must say. Uh, so um, that's about it. I, I you know, got on there and worked some stations. I talked to folks back home, but the main intent was to get people to operate there. Um, we had kids come in the booth. We had experienced operators. We had non-experienced operators, non-amps. So um, this year was better than two years ago because we were just coming out of COVID. And everybody was wearing masks and not intermingling too much. So this is more like a go-to station. More like a go-to station, but we had guys sit there for an hour or so and work with CW. Um, so a lot of people had fun, and they were like ET, and they phoned home. You know, I made some contacts back home when I was there, so it, it was a lot of fun, but not not serious at all. So anybody want to guess how many people attended Dayton this year? Well, on the internet said it was almost like thirty-four thousand. It's thirty-five thousand. Thirty-five thousand. Yeah. Thirty-five thousand. Can I make a special request about people out here? Um, I forgot to mention this, and because we have such a large crowd here, uh, I posted, and I have my thing here, it's in my box. I posted on Nextdoor, is anybody familiar with Nextdoor app? Mm -hmm. About Field Day, okay? And I didn't realize that it's only posting to my neighborhood. So if anybody has access to their neighborhood, like Burleysville or any other, Rutgersville or wherever, Green, uh, if you would contact me, it would be great if you could post it to your next door. So I got some responses. One lady said that um, I, she went last year and she had a great time. I think she brought her kids. Another lady responded said her, she, she was able to talk to her husband in Vietnam using the um, uh, phone patch service. And so that was pretty cool. So back when I was in Vietnam, uh, they had, they call it Mars stations, military amateur radio service. So we were able to go into a little booth and talk for five minutes. And not anybody remember Barry Goldwater? He was a ham, and he loaned his station to to the armed, so, armed forces. So when they contacted Barry Goldwater in the states with his big antennas and the outfit, he would pay for the phone call. Because back then you had to pay for long distance. This is back in the 60s, early 70s. He would pay for the phone call to wherever, uh, like my parents were in Virginia, and he was in Arizona. So he would pay for that phone call from uh, Arizona to Virginia for my parents. But that was pretty cool. I got a response in next door, and I think people are looking at it. So if anybody uh, would would like to put it on their area, I, I'm not sure if you can actually do the whole world, but I, I couldn't find out how to do it. But I, I would like for you all to publicize that. Wear, wear your t-shirts every day. And uh, especially at pickleball, if you play pickleball. We'll watch them before you show up at Field Day. All right, sorry to diverse here, but uh, right. and for the folks out, out here watching on uh, Zoom. So, questions? Anybody have any questions about, about Dayton and Benjamin? Where would you recommend? I mean, obviously, we have that many people in one locale, you know, all the logistic issues, you know, food. Well, lodging and all that happy stuff you imagine that. Yeah, I, I, the earlier you, you reserve a hotel, um, you start maybe in January or February. Uh, when you, if you wait too long, then all of the hotels in Dayton and Middleton with the, and Springfield get, get filled up. Uh, I know folks that camp. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about camping, because that's how I, I know all the secret spots. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I prefer to camp. And there's, 
bread, bed and breakfasts now that are, that are uh, and Airbnb or BRBO. Yeah, yeah. So we did Airbnb and Caesar Creek. I, I, I couldn't yeah. find a room. Yeah. Yeah. Caesar Creek. Caesar Creek. Yeah, I love yeah. the parks. Yeah, it's like twenty. Days. Okay, so I'll, and in fact, I got another tent today. I'm on the left side of now. There's a camp called LSD. It stands for Lousy Stinking Dump. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, uh, tell them about the Air Force Museum. Oh yes, the Air Force Museum is located in, uh, in the Dayton area, it's on the east side, and um, it's it's really a good place to, to go. There's lots to see there. You can easily spend a day there and, and not see everything. Bob, have you ever been to VOA? The VOA? I have not, but the VOA, there's a VOA center from Westchester, Ohio, is it, or yeah. it just west of uh, there. And well, uh, VOA is the Voice of America. So when, when my dad was in the military, we, he was stationed in Istanbul, Turkey. This is in the 50s. I'm dating myself. Uh, we took, he took, he bought a Zenith Transoceanic Radio because that was our only source of getting news. And Voice of America was our primary news from home. Uh, uh, BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation. And then I found out about Radio Luxembourg, which transmitted rock and roll. Okay, they were they were a rock and roll station that found out about the Beatles and the Hollies and all these groups back in the back in the 50s. So um, the VOA uh, site is this course now shut down, but it's well worth going to if you if you go out to date as well as the, the Air Force Museum. And Friday and Saturday evening, you can go to the Dayton Amateur Radio Club Clubhouse. Um, does they have an open house at their club? Why don't we have a clubhouse like that? <laughs> well, we don't have a ham fest <laughs> like this, you know. So, uh, like, and I, they also have a, a large uh, mobile van that uh, that they built with you know, equipment in it, etc. So, that, and that's normally parked there. This year, they also had. You remember that when we went to. Hartford, the Collins radio van that was in there, that was actually a taken this year. Oh, yeah? Okay. So there was a... The, so let me talk about the flea market for a minute here. You know, you can get some, some good deals on stuff in the flea market, you have to be careful. But for some of us who have been in the hobby for a long time, walking around the flea market is like walking through your history. You see all these radios that, as a kid, you wanted to have, and, and, and now it's kind of like, but I really want that. You know, so, uh, there's more than I left that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There were a couple of years there where, where there were pallets of Collins S-Line equipment that were there. Uh, I think the, the Mormon church had decided to upgrade their radios or whatever that they had stored in the, the bowels of the temple in, in Salt Lake City. And, and it's just, Oh, other questions. Have, have we made any of you interested, perhaps, in actually going to date? We'll be more than happy uh, when you get ready to do that to give you some advice about how to approach it and what to look for and how to handle it. You can sign up as a volunteer on the Ambention website. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. Get, you get your tickets early. Your tickets have a number on it, and I have a story I want to tell. So for years, Stu and I have been going to Hamfest, and he'd grumble. He'd say, he'd say, you know, I've been going to Hamfest for 40 years, and I never won anything. <laughs> never won anything. About, like, we were still at an era at that time. And so one day, I'm looking at the TV monitors that have all the numbers up there, and I know what my number is, and I know his is one off, and I'm, I'm going, Stu. Stu, you should look at the monitors. Ah, I don't want to look at the monitors. Stu, look at the monitors. And he won a prize. And I have these photographs. It's on my, on my, on my website. It's in the, the, the big stories about this. my friend Stu wins a prize. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, www.k4du.us. And uh, it's kind of amazing pictures because the, the it's like Stu's almost saying to the guy, did my friend put you up to this, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then later on he's out in the flea market and he's showing this thing. And, 
he was really excited. But it was it was kind of like it, it never believed that that would happen anywhere at any ham fest. It went anything. Um, I think I had lots of prizes at, at the Peyton Ham Fest. Lots of stuff they give away. Uh, new products are announced there every year. Flex Radio announced a whole new series of Flex Radios. So the six thousand I bought about two years ago is. No, absolutely not obsolete, but they've got faster processors and new stuff going on. Uh, Kenwood came out with a new handheld, I believe, if I recall. Yeah, and of course the, the, the other craft stuff. It, K H one. Yeah, so yeah, it is and you get to talk to people who know, you know, what what their products are because they design them or they they market them and, and you, you go face to face with anybody that's there. Working West, the president of the ARL, the, the general manager of the ARL, any one of these people, they're, they're all there. So, yeah, it's a wonderful time. Anything else you guys want to add? So we're going to have a caravan next year? Yeah. Well, that's a lot of fun, too. Yeah, that would be that would be true. Or I made a lot of 5-2 contacts on the way out. Yeah. That, that, it depends on which route you get, or which route you take. You, you, normally, if you're on the, the, the 64 west and then up to 30, and not in 35, right. it's not out until you get out into a little bit flatter area where you're able to maintain some of the, those contacts. But yeah, we do that a lot too. You just turn the radio to 5 too. So uh, I had to rent a car and I flew out there. The only car they could give me budget rented car was an electric car. Never had an electric car. Don't know anything about electric cars other than probably nice batteries to run my radios. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's my complaint. They didn't tell me you have to charge the car before you bring it back or they're going to charge you $75, right? Wow. So first charger I went to, it, when I looked at the thing, it gives you a readout. It said 10% in nine in 90 minutes, 10% charge would take an hour and a half. What is going on? So I googled I googled about electric car charger places. Next, what I found was Tesla. Okay, only Teslas can go there. This was a Kia electric. Then I found this. It's called some America Electric or something at a at a Walmart. It was like 15 miles from where I was. So I'm already he's discharging. As he's yeah, I'm, I'm already <laughs> discharging the car to get to the Walmart, plug it in, and thank goodness this one says it's going to take uh, 45 minutes to charge it to 90 percent, which I needed to get back to the airport. <laughs> so for anybody that owns electric cars, good riddance. I mean, <laughs> it, I, 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 can, I can tell you I do not have problems charging my Tesla. It, 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 oh, your Tesla's yeah. you, your goal because they have Tesla places all over. But my little Kia had to have uh, a different yeah. kind of plug. So anyway, that's my yeah, story on electric cars. <laughs> all right. Eight in 2024, that's the story, and we're sticking to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Request for